Hello and welcome to this CodeBuddies.org live code hangout. By joining a hangout, you can ask questions, work through tutorials, share ideas, and pair program on open source projects. Today we're going to be working on an open source project called Sustainable Mobility API. If you're interested in checking out the source code for the project, uh, you can see the link right below the video over there, I guess. <laughs> And what this API provides is a way for mobility operators. Uh, you could think of a few companies who are helping people get around um, town, uh, run errands, get to and from work, um, go to entertainment uh, and other venues on the weekend. Um, they want to include the mobility operators and the people who are being mobile, who are going, going around town, want to uh, include awareness of the carbon impact of their mobility so they can make an informed decision and potentially offset the, the carbon costs of mobility because inherently we're going to incur some cost. We need to be mobile, we need to go to work, often um, going out on the weekends. So this library is just a, a Python project that gives an estimator function. Uh, in the original design, the estimator takes a mode of transport and a distance traveled and returns a value in grams of CO2 for that trip. It has optional parameters uh, where you can override the vehicle occupancy. Um, I think we had one more parameter, maybe not. I'll have to check <laughs> the, the API. In effect, we're relying on statistical averages, you know, fleet average uh, efficiency calculated in this case by the uh, European Environment Agency. And this is um, working and uh, fairly easy to use. And we've published this as open source on GitHub. And one of the first uh, feature requests we got by Eric M, 1995, is to allow uh, CO2 calculations based on liters of or some volume metric, volume unit of, <laughs> of uh, fuel. And we're inher inherently using the metric system, I think, as just a best practice. <laughs> you should default to metric and then uh, convert to empirical units if or when needed. Um, so <laughs> uh, it can, prov uh, can prevent issues. Metric is a lot easier to deal with and I think more of the scientific community are using metric. Um, so in this session we probably won't be dealing with gallons or miles as much as liters in our distance um, metric is kilometers and using SI units. SI, SI? Or just SI units anyway. <laughs> So we've had some discussion on this thread around API design. Now this is Marcus Shepard, my colleague, who's the primary architect of this library. And he's a very experienced Python developer and data scientist. So I'm leaning on what he recommends for implementation. So I sort of primed the question, how should we design this thing? And his response was, um, we can follow the design of our current estimator, which is a mode-based estimator, and essentially inherit or create an enum, Python enum, and just choose the essentially the types of fuel. And he's suggesting maybe to turn an average value which I might take one step further and also provide a calculation based on a specific um, input of liters. We'll work out the API in the process of this live coding session as well as through the peer review process. I'll open a pull request to close this issue. Leading up to the work. We've done a little bit of research. I added an addendum here. There's several websites that have um, pretty useful data. Uh, we're not 
expert in carbon emissions or um, you know a lot of this needs to be done at a higher level usually through the government or s scientific community uh, the international panel on intergovernmental panel on climate change for example uh, have an extensive uh, database of um, fuel factors like m you can multiply a factor by uh, volume to get the grams co2 produced for a particular volume of fuel combusted um, so these are all available here on the issue number 33 I'll just post that in the chat for the record and I think I'm just going to dig in to one of the kind of nice summarized tables of data published by the Natural Resources Canada And the cool thing about this one is uh, we're interested in petrol or gasoline and diesel combustion, but also increasingly transport um, modes are being, you know, <laughs> fueled by ethanol and biodiesel. So why not include those in our estimates too? Um, I couldn't find another example here in unless this IPCC emissions factor database has it, or more likely it does. Um, that has that includes biofuel and even ethanol. It was kind of weird. Most of them only focus on gasoline, petrol, that is, and uh, uh, diesel. And we got, it looks like we got a response down here. Ooh, units is going to be a yeah, we were mentioning that earlier. It's going to be a little bit of a difficult proposition. Liters, gallons, cubic meters, mass, ton, whatever Americans use. Yeah, same here. I've only been thinking about it in liters or gallons, not lines. Keep it simple, see if we can solve uh, or outsource some of the more difficult parts to the pipeline ecosystem. I'll, and granted, I can search for that too. I'm just responding. GitHub, you can have like real time conversations almost. That's pretty cool. being accessible to various <laughs> uh, measurement systems is going to be an important part. So you can see this is <laughs> going to take a little bit of um, finesse and trial and error to get uh, a working, a minimum viable working um, implementation for this feature request. And yeah, we'll start small, let's get something out there and improve on it. You know, we're at 0 0.3 milestones, what we're working on right now. So we're trying to be lean and uh, not take on too much. Cool. And I'll just mention that I'm going to be I'm considering using this real quick.
go ahead and dig into the code a little bit. Um, we've got an initial implementation here. Uh, the project consists of a few main parts. There's a Python library that does the kind of li heavy lifting, so to speak. It's not even that heavy lifting. It, it calculates the um, the CO2 estimates based on the input. So we have a, it's an estimator. It's really just one method, and essentially it relies on a model that we got from the European Environment Agency, as it's documented here, uh, which is also deprecated. We have to figure that out, and essentially it gives us coefficient and uh, average occupancy to calculate um, grams of CO2 per passenger kilometer for an individual trip. Uh, so we're not going to be modifying this, but we're going to be uh, following this pattern. <laughs> I suppose we'll just put it right in here. We don't need another file for model because this is our model that describes mode of transport and we'll have a model that describes the uh, fuel. Doc string. T-R-E or L-I-T-E-R? stuff. Let's put the modes here. I don't know. Uh, Marcus did this. I think the methods should come after the uh, the enum values, maybe. But So as per, I don't want to tab back and forth <laughs> this, um, we've got, I think we'll just call it petrol. This is kilograms per liter. Oh. to preserve the unit somehow. But I don't know how to do that.
do get the branch started. Oops. Set this. I've got it copied to clipboard. One moment. All right, we got our master branch up to date. Now, it looks like Marcus has worked on this recently, so let me be careful about overriding his work. Oh, dang. How'd I do that? Oh, no, no. I didn't mean to make a mistake. Got the imports here. Push it up, I'll open a pull request right off the bat <clears throat> so we have something to, to diff and discuss. <clears throat> so we should notice now on GitHub we've got a new branch and this is gonna, I'll link it to an issue so we can track it. And I'm gonna draft draft pull request so that we know it's not ready to merge yet. It's a clear way to signal <laughs> that this is not ready, don't merge it inadvertently, but that there's something going on and then we can check it out in the process. And also the cool thing about GitHub is when you kind of mention another issue in the, in the description, the, um, It'll automatically link it there and it shows up also kind of reactively, automatically there. And we'll see that it's in a draft state and there's a pull request in process. Very cool. Now <clears> that <throat> so we've got these emissions factors, let's take a look at how we're going to do the calculation. So 
essentially we have an initializer. takes in any parameters that we want to be able to pass in when creating an instance of this method and then a, an instance of this enum, enum, enum. <laughs> and then a method, one or more methods can be attached to it to actually do the estimation. In this case, Marcus has kind of suggested a couple of them. Um, two per unit. I'd also like to go to the extent Of allowing um, <clears throat> allowing there to be uh, basically an input for the volume of like the, the liters of gas basically the liters of fuel used start with the CO2 per unit. That's it. Per CO2 per liter. I can kind of see why you put the initializer above this, but okay. is how he's getting the hmm, the value from these enum enums. I guess it's instead tuple. This is the average occupancy. This is average CO2. Per vehicle kilometers. Per vehicle kilometers. So I think it, what happens is in the init, these two boats get unpacked and you save them as instance variables.
<laughs> exactly, exactly what he suggested, or I've already done it. Uh, but he's spelling the English way. Or the American English, I think. Uh, we have to pick. I don't care, to be honest. Um, is it leader or leader? go. We'll just go to change spelling everywhere. Looks good. Quest came in with it. Spell leader or leader? Leader or leader? Leaders. <laughs> God, some strife for people. Maybe I should just <laughs> use both. I can actually just do that in my initialization. Should we do that? Well, if anyone complains, I'll do it better. <laughs> it's all right. Now we've got our estimator. So essentially, it's going to be estimate. Uh, TO2, I think. Copy and paste this code even though most of it's not needed at all. Just so I have the same structure and signature. Except I'm going to put methods after. And if they want to be able to Hey, thanks for the raid, Kessler6. I appreciate it. Welcome to the channel. <laughs> One second ago. All right. We're working on a uh, sustainable mobility API, open source on GitHub. If you want to check out the code, um, have any questions?
questions or comments, um, welcome, uh, I welcome them when we can discuss any suggestions for the project. Uh, I work at a mobility company, so we're trying to actually add a uh, sustainability component to our product as well as produce this open source library for the uh, mobility ecosystem. There's a few external stakeholders who are, they've already shown interest in this project and opened up uh, this feature request here. So just for context to the new viewers, we're working on GitHub issue here. And we've done a little bit of research on how to get these uh, values. Essentially, we want to know how many grams of uh, CO2 are produced per volume of uh, various fuel types for mobility. And the uh, best source we could find, aside from the international intergovernmental panel on climate change, which has an extensive database, came from the Natural Resources Canada. They have this fact sheet, which has this summary table. And boom, that's what we're using. Uh, yeah. Great time to think about it. Man, have you been, uh, KSR6, have you been uh, tracking the uh, uh, oil prices per barrel? It went negative yesterday. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, I glimpsed it too. I didn't really look much into it, but it's, yeah, I think <laughs> it's a little bit of a wake-up call. We need to get transition to a more uh, sustainable society in general, I think. This um, <laughs> has been my main takeaway from this whole opportunity um, and mixed blessing of being able to um, so, sort of center and reflect amidst like uh, the pandemic. So yeah, <laughs> trying to help raise awareness. And the analogy here is like when we buy food at the grocery store, we, we know the ingredients, you know, we can check the label, see if it's got a lot of sugar or calories or whatever. And why not have that sort of awareness when we're moving around town, we're taking taxis or cars or bus, train, tram, uh, scooter, e-bike. All of them have a little bit of a uh, footprint, carbon-wise. And primarily when they're uh, combusting non-renewable uh, or relying on non-renewable energy sources or semi-renewable, I suppose, ethanol, though. Yeah, I can't keep the oil on the ground. Yeah, and that pressure is political and financial, mainly. <laughs> That's the pressure that forces it out, I think. <laughs> oh yeah, so this is our pull request, and then we've got a couple of changes going on. So let's, uh, I think we might be able to wrap this up without uh, too much ado and get some initial review. <laughs> let's see, I just wanna double check. I'm copying and pasting code from our previous uh, sort of implementation, so I just wanna make sure to read very carefully to not make any obvious copy and paste errors. So essentially what we have is a, an, a Python enum. And just while we've got some new viewers here, I'll explain the quickly the architecture of the project. Um, we started off with a little Python library to do a calculation based on mode of transport and distance traveled in kilometers. And it outputs a uh, CO2 emissions in grams for that. And our first feedback was like, well, we're, we're not, you know, we're not using Python in production at our company. In fact, well, where I work, we're uh, not really using it. Our production system is mainly JavaScript and uh, Amazon AWS, everything. <laughs> so then our, our next step was actually just to wrap it in a lightweight API here. Um, you can see, so we got this estimator package, which is published on the Python packaging index, open source. Check it out on PyP, and then this API, which is packaged with the Docker, and we have a serverless um, deployment, so you can uh, at least deploy to AWS. We're working on how to uh, deploy it. You know, if you want to run it in Kubernetes or something like that, or if you're not using AWS, you might be using Azure or something. We don't have those. We don't have it packaged for those yet. So the best uh, option would be just to use the Docker file, or you can just run it uh, natively. It's really a minimal. Uh, it doesn't do a whole lot, to be honest. The API is just using this open source library from uh, who made this connection? Zalando that takes a, a specification file and wraps it and uh, links it to like Python method in our case. So uh, the method's not doing a whole lot. It's just kind of getting more HTTP responsive instead of uh, returning the straight value 
as a float from Python library. We're um, giving people proper HTTP response and uh, serving it up. So you can, you don't have to rely on us to host it or anything like that. It's open source. It can be deployed in your own infrastructure, used for internal purposes, modified. It's under the MIT license. So there's a, you can do what you want with it. So there it is. And all we're doing is just implementing today one feature request from some friends in the Netherlands, I think. From TURN, T-U-R-N-N. -N. They're another mobility company. Uh, you could call them a competitor of ours, but in a way, we're trying to promote an open ecosystem. And, uh, you know, so we're doing a little bit of open source work. And what I like about this TURN app I hope our app sort of uh, follows suit. You know, that you mix, the idea here is mobility as a service, so you mix different types of modes into one app, uh, and you basically help people select the mode that meets their needs in the current moment. And uh, if a bike works or a scooter works, then great. If a trip is longer, um, they might need a, you know, train or a bus, or if they're crunch for time they might need a taxi or even a car rental if they're going to be you know going on the weekends but the cool thing about this turn so that's mobility as a service is it actually provides a co2 estimate in the app so like the carbon uh nutritional information so to speak transport nutritional information is displayed right there you compare the price uh you know health health factors and environmental factors all at a glance pretty cool so i hope that uh is a general trend in the mobility industry, and I work for WIM. We are in the early phases of working with this, so I can't promise anything will happen, but we're also a mobility as a service provider, one of the pioneering companies there. We blend together many different mobility types. So enough uh, sort of context. I'm not trying to do any kind of spammy promotion, but letting you know what we're about and why this project exists. And let's hop over to the code. So, yeah, this is just a really cool project. <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, dealing with geographic uh, distances, and we got some cool dependencies. We're trying to keep the code we write minimal and simple and rely on other organizations for the heavy lifting parts. So we've got a data structure that represents, estimates, or represents CO2 per liter of various fuel types. So far, we're able to cover petrol, Ethyl, ethanol 10 and 85, diesel, biodiesel 5 and 20. And we initialize this enum with uh, either a user provided average CO2 per liter. If they just know better than us, then they can override that. Or if that doesn't exist, I'm sorry, when you initialize it, we're actually just pulling that from the fleet averages, which were published by the uh, Canadian. Natural Resources Canada, cool. But when you go to estimate it, uh, all we need you to provide is the liters that were burned, and I don't know whether or not it should uh, be spelled L-I-T-R-E-S or L-I-T-E-R-S, so I went with the internationalized spelling, and not the American spelling. And if you want, you can override the average CO2 per liter. We might uh, provide localized APIs for this. Um, but I don't wanna get too kind of caught up in all that. And so this is copy and paste the code. This is what I need to actually just um, return here is essentially delete all this. And it's a, a factor. So we're just going to liters or uh, let's see, average CO2 per liter times the number of liters. I think that's about it. It's not, like I said, it's, we're pretty minimal here. Uh, not a lot of moving parts, trying to keep it simple and clear and linking it in with more authoritative work. And that means we can get feedback and make improvements in a lean and agile way and not kind of have to do this whole big implementation, have everything perfect from day one. So let's go ahead and push this up. Just gonna scan it one more time. spelling errors or obvious things that are wrong. And then my colleague Marcus will review it and give me some really good feedback, I'm sure.
Okay, so six, are you working on any uh, projects? What brings you by the Python channel? Are you interested in mobility or urban sustainability or what, what's your background or interests? And anybody else in the chat, feel free. Um, I'm trying to make this a more participatory channel um, by including the chat, for example. And we're gonna be trying to do some pair programming soon on, on stream on a couple of cool projects. Sencha TN. It's getting kind of cold, actually. Very good. All right, let's go ahead and see if we can get a little bit of quick PR review. By ping Marcus, he's usually pretty quick. It's a little bit iffy to do work stuff on stream, I know. But, because not everybody's published their membership, organization membership. Um, damn. In any case, this is how GitHub works. You essentially, and probably people are familiar with this. Um, Just track issues. This is not leading to GitHub by any means, and you can link them together um, with changes to your code base. And they're kind of the same thing—an issue and a pull request. But in any case, um, the pull request lets you really quickly see what was changed in the code, and you can even comment on it, like multiple lines or stuff like that. It's pretty pretty convenient. Um, so I think this. PR might be just ready for um, review. In other words, I can take it out of draft state. Indicate that it's ready for review and see if we can get it, get some feedback and it merged. I don't want to waste people's time too much on the stream waiting for a review. I might just... Um, Marcus is usually pretty good about responding to things quick. In the meantime, I suppose while we're waiting for this, we'll watch up here if there's a little number icon. We can take a quick look at mm, yeah, see our, uh, part, our friends in the Netherlands suggested this. Um, so let's look at the context a little bit more deeply. There's some cool stuff I found in researching this. And in fact, I opened another issue. I'll just hop over to real quick in a minute. We'll take a look. They published some CO2 emission factors in Dutch, which I can't quite. <laughs> Actually, these are really good. I just assumed I couldn't read it because it was in Dutch, but I think I can. Mostly, eh, we're pretty close with what we've done. We have to figure out which of these um, are used for mobility, for transport. We've got E85, E95. We're not differentiating between Netherlands and European Union or even American consumption. I think they're, they're so close. Is it, this is, uh, I don't know what these mean. So yeah, I, I can't really use this source. I'd have to, I can translate it though. Okay, so that was the original request. And there's some cool websites we found. Now, the first thing I'll just show you is this greenhouse gas equivalencies calculator. It's a mouthful to say, but uh, it's actually pretty cool. Let's just say we have a bunch of uh, gas gallons. This is an American website. Uh, let's say we burn 100 gallons of gasoline. And what does that equate to? Well, it's about 2,000 miles 
driven by a car. So with 100 gallons, you can drive about 2,000 miles. Um, or it's about you know, 0.1 uh, year driven in a car. 100 gallons equates to 100 gallons because we're same metric. Um, diesel, it looks like it's a little bit more, a little less than a year. <laughs> Efficient. Yes. And 900 pounds of coal. Tanker trucks can hold a whole lot of gasoline. <laughs> you know, just like weird stuff, but they're kind of natural to compare. 113,000 smartphones phones could have been charged for burning that 100 gallons of gas. Let's just take a look at one gallon of gas. I'm so confused. So is diesel more or less efficient than gas? I think it's less, right? Almost like one third of a LED lamp. This is kind of the cool stuff, though. Uh, that I didn't realize that, you know, and these are such small fractional values. Let's go back to 100 or 1,000 even. Let's just say 1,000 gallons of gasoline. And check out this um, carbon sequestration. So, in order to offset 1,000 gallons of gasoline, the CO2 produced in burning 1,000 gallons of gasoline, you have to plant 147 seedlings and let them grow for 10 years. Almost 200 trees need to grow for 10 years for 1,000 gallons of gas. And about 11 acres of uh, forest land will offset 1,000 gallons of gas in a year. But check this out. If you can just preserve forests from conversion to cropland for one year, if you can just halt the spread of sort of, uh, well, either you know, petroleum intensive, uh, agroforestry, agroforestry, agricultural food production, well, sort of agroforestry industry, I put them all, linked them, linked them together. Uh, you can have a, a huge, it has a huge power. Like you can offset for just one acre. Let's see how many, we'd have one acre. Uh, geez, we can offset almost about 20,000 gallons of gasoline. That's crazy. Just by keeping the land like just <laughs> pristine, more or less, um, you know, managed perhaps, uh, but letting the forest and let it be a little bit wild, so or rewilding the land as well. Pretty cool. Twenty-two million smartphones could be charged. So yeah, this is a kind of fun thing. I don't know how we'll use it in practice, but this is just one thing we discovered while we were looking for these official sources of carbon estimates. Uh, and again, we turned to the Natural Resources Canada for our quick summary table, which seems like a good start. Mm. And this, also the greenhouse gap, gas equivalencies calculator has sources, so it gives us the actual formulas they're using to uh, calculate that. Now, it only, for our purposes, uh, provided gasoline and diesel, so it wasn't quite as comprehensive as I was hoping. This, in terms of comprehensive data sources, is crazy. The uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Emission Factor Database um, has relatively recent data on carbon sources and sinks. So where are the carbons entering the atmosphere from? Like the sources going into the atmosphere and sinks are pulling it out of the atmosphere, pulling, like sequestering it back into the earth or into um, other substrate like forests. And um, they go by sector, and uh, um, from my understanding, transport and I should actually get this back up here because uh, the main sectors that are responsible for like a huge number, a huge amount of the um, CO2 emissions or CO2 equivalent emissions, because there's other greenhouse gases that we can factor in, are uh, transport takes almost all of the oil produced. It's a huge uh, portion of it. And I think either agriculture, which isn't represented here, or power, I guess industry could be here. Agriculture could be in their industry. Uh, so, but anyway, transport has a huge opportunity to improve what's going on here. Maybe this is a, 
This Our World in Data is also a really great um, source if you're interested in lots of uh, open data and data visualizations uh, for many um, aspects of our world, not just uh, CO2 and CO2 emissions. But I know that um, oil is on pace to out uh, to surpass coal. It's not quite there yet, so that's a pretty big one. And CO2 emissions by sector, here's what I was looking for. We got electricity and heat production is the biggest one, and then transport's right up there. So man, there's a huge opportunity in transport uh, to get us out of this idea of um, you know personal automobile, um, single occupancy vehicle, commuting to and from work that's way far away. You know, we need to move into higher density modes of transport. We need to change the way we organize urban environments so that um, we don't have to travel so far or as much, bring sometimes the uh, needs to the people rather than people to the needs, stuff like that. So yeah, I think a lot of this electricity and heat production might go to household use, but I, I don't know the breakdown of that. That's just speculation. So this, yeah, again, this Our World in Data is an excellent site. We were actually here recently doing uh, research for the COVID uh, statistics. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff here about uh, COVID testing. And, um, and yeah, this is just a really cool site. If you are interested in data, data visualization, visual communication, open data, <laughs> open source, because the, uh, the whole library, all the data is open the website itself is a creative commons so that's open and the software for visualizing uh, all the data is available on github as well it's not really packaged for general use on any arbitrary website but here it is it's a really cool initiative our world in data let's just check over here Marcus might be at lunch or something. I don't, I don't really expect him to like have to jump right up from on command, so that's not what I'm trying to do here. I was just hoping that you could see the other half of this um, process, which is sometimes more involved, the peer review part, where we kind of pick each other's code apart in um, constructive ways and not adversarial, and uh, it help improve the output because there will be probably a few more commits that I'll need to make before we'll agree to merge this. We want to get feedback from Marcus and the original um, Eric in 1995. Who said that they're not really so much of a coding person, so I don't know if they need to do the code or not. But in any case, I'll just ping them and say, hey, we opened a pull request here. Checker there. Well, that's about it. Hey, I appreciate uh, <laughs> stopping by. I don't have a lot more to show on this stream. Uh, I thought maybe it would be a two hour stream, but it turned out, unless Marcus does a quick uh, review. There's a quick feature to implement a minimum viable thing. We're not going to do unit conversions and things at this point. Uh, I know that some stakeholders will want to get their um, estimates based on gallons, and maybe they want to spell liters a little different. Uh, we can look at those improvements kind of on request as they're needed. Uh, but for now, we'll just uh, operate under the assumption that liters and grams per liter are sufficient, and uh, any kind of um, uh, unit conversions uh, would be done in the calling code, so wherever the data is used. Um, the other part of this, though, is writing the API endpoint. I suppose, actually, I can do that. Let me think about this for a second. That's that's good. Uh, that I, I thought. So we have the Python implementation here that Marcus will review, and do we have this API wrapper? Which is going to be a little bit trickier because it's got it's 
What we need to do is look at the specification. Okay, so in our open API specification, which is just a uh, sort of an open standard for defining APIs, um, HTTP APIs, that is. Um, so you essentially design it. I usually try to use a design tool, so let's see if there's no. Um, online open API header. I think there's a couple I just. job and essentially what it does is it's interactive documentation for APIs uh, so if I want to import a adjacent it's open API tools list is a good one And it's under active development. It's got a pretty nice interface. Let me just try one more time to import. Oh, yeah, upload. There it is. And we'll just say load definition. All right, JSON parse successfully. Now we'll check it out. So, yeah, we'll actually bump the version. I think we're at zero point. point zero uh, the swagger definition is Apache licensed um, which is basically MIT it's really close um, it's just got some kind of protections against patent aggression which is increasingly a problem in software development so now we need to figure out the API design to accommodate CO2 estimation based on fuel as well as mode. What we actually did, and now I'm just getting ad hoc about it, but um, we just thought everything would be based on mode. So if you look at the parameters here, we're taking mode and distance as first class, and then occupancy is optional. So I'll turn this around, I'll add an endpoint, and we'll have to create a follow-up task to um, uh, normalize our API. But what I'm going to do is create one that says um, fuel. Estimate CO2. And we'll need an operation. People make essentially get requests here by passing in some um, parameters. Looks like a message from Marcus. Another thing we're discussing um, is sort of the some of the ethical aspects of ordering non-essential items during the coronavirus lockdown, prompted by an article today, um, which I'd be curious on your thoughts as well. Essentially, you know, ordering stuff online because we're not really going out to um, stores and, and such to get things like I don't know fashion or or I don't know electronics or whatever. We're minimizing that, but what about ordering those from online? sources like Amazon or online bookstores. Uh, what are your thoughts, if you've got any on that? I've, for example, have ordered some books. I think I ordered like six books from Blackwell's from the UK just recently. And we did buy a birthday present for my son at the store because <laughs> he's he didn't have a birthday party or anything. We bought a bike also from the bike shop. but. Uh, you know, I think that's almost an essential thing. Uh, in any case, what are your thoughts on 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 you know purchasing things at this point? 
during the um, social distancing. So what we're going to do is just uh, we're going to need to map this endpoint to a function in our Python class. So here is where <laughs> the architecture is going to change a little bit. But essentially, we have this API mo uh, module. And it has some methods in there. And this get CO2 estimate method is the one that we're dealing with right now. And what the Swagger um, specification does is it just tells us which Python to map that function to. And connection um, will wire things together for us. It'll pass in all the parameters as arguments to the function. And then we just need to return the result of the calculation. So essentially what we'll be doing is creating a new method. Fuel get CO2 estimate maybe if I get fuel CO2 estimate and get mode CO2 estimate. Not too bad. Not too verbose. And our arguments are, we'll keep them consistent, I suppose. It seems like um, connection is supposed to be handling some of this kind of validation for us. So I'm not going to reinvent that. I'm not sure what Russell um, was encountering when he uh, found that necessary. Because even this type checking, I think, is supposed to be done. transport modes, huh? Deep deprecated. No, it required. Oh yeah, here it is. Ah, uh, we so HTTP API, we enforce it to be lowercase. I wonder if that matters. Our HTTP um, query string parameters, are they case sensitive or is it always going to treat it as lowercase? Hmm. Well, essentially, we're going to do the same thing here, uh, but. That's our Python method there. Uh, we can add some descriptions. All right, 
essentially we'll uh, take an, uh, we need a fuel type and the, um, hey, what's up, Rich? Welcome. This time we're working on the Sustainable Mobility API, uh, which is an open source library here on GitHub. It's part of my day job. We get to do a little, some and sustainability activities. We've got some pretty cool stuff going on there. Um, the main thing I could talk about, I guess, would be the library that we're producing. And we're sort of using it internally. We're eating our own tofu. But what the goal is here is help people um, make informed decisions when choosing our daily mobility options. So, for example, you go to the store, you buy cereal or whatever, and you can check the label and say, well, it's got a lot of sugar in there. Or, oh, I'm allergic to wheat. I need a gluten-free option, right? So it's, you've got nutritional labeling and ingredients on all your food options. Well, why not uh, have that information similarly when we are making daily choices about mobility? And mobility um, being modes of transport to get us around town, whether it's you know, person powered or electric or petrol or you know internal combustion or other modes, uh, other fuels. And basically what we're trying to do is calculate the uh, CO2 emissions for several types of fuel here. Uh, Natural Resources Canada published a table we're using. Uh, gram CO2 tailpipe emissions per liter. Well, they published in the kilograms, but I converted to grams. So for gasoline, ethanol, 1085 diesel, biodiesel, 5 and 20. So we've got this Python model updated now, which I, at this point I thought I was kind of done with the pull request because we just take all those um, CO2 factors and kind of um, made a little function to do the arithmetic. There's not much to it. But then I remembered uh, we also have an API for this so that people can deploy it uh, via Docker. Whoa, there's no modules watching out there. Um, or serverless. I don't want to drag along too many um, <laughs> options for packaging. I think a Docker file, in my opinion, is enough. So essentially all I've got to do now, and this is actually probably a more complicated part, is create an API definition to incorporate this new endpoint. So that's what I'm doing here creating a Python method and using this library from uh, Zelando called Connection, which takes an um, open API specification file and um, kind of basically maps these endpoints, these paths, to Python functions and um, takes the parameters and kind of parses them, validates that they're of the expected types, and sends them into the um, Python method. I'm going to close a bunch of these tabs. This was from my earlier research, figuring out what our, our CO2 factors would look like. Here's the, here's the uh, original feature request. Ah, sorry. And We've been looking at some cool data sources and our world and data came back up again. Uh, it was a great resource for the uh, coronavirus data. It also turns out to be a great resource for exploring uh, carbon emissions, CO2 emissions uh, by country, by industry, I think even by fuel type like coal, um, uh, oil, you know, high level stuff. Uh, this was a cool one we found also during the research showing that of all the oil produced or imported, I don't know where importing is if this is a worldwide thing, but in any case, uh, the majority of it goes to the transport sector, which includes both you know, personal and probably commercial transport. But in any case, um, it just shows we have a huge opportunity in transport to kind of uh, go in the direction of carbon neutrality, which is the point of our API, helping to um, kind of offer a positive reinforcement. All right, so we've got one endpoint, which is our original one. We were estimating CO2 based on distance and mode of transport, and you could 
get the distance either by giving us origin and destination lat lines or just actual distance in kilometers. Again, not doing unit conversions, we're just um, relying on the calling code to do the unit conversion. And uh, you can override these parameters. Sometimes like a bus might have 100 people on there or two people on there and the um, fuel economy per passenger kilometer is gonna be pretty different in those cases. So in order to get a little bit more accurate with our estimate, we allow all the model parameters to be overridden. Hey, what's up, Deja Vid? Welcome back. So uh, now I'm just kind of refactoring the API design and uh, I'm not touching this one just yet. I will in a minute map. And it's going to be a backwards breaking change, so that means it'll we'll actually be like at a 1.0 version of this API pretty soon. Hmm. Or I could tag a few onto the back of it. Have you guys ever done any API design? I, I don't. I'm just really winging it here. This uh, is a sort of an afterthought. It's an important part of our project so that not everybody not every company is using Python and they need a way to integrate this API into their infrastructure and so by providing um, an HTTP API you can just deploy it you know in AWS or Google or Azure or DigitalOcean and sort of just call it from your programming language of choice a deja vu. All right, what kind of, uh, are they open source projects or what kind of projects have you done an API for? And yeah, I mean, that, you know, it's probably even better because then you, you have, um, you know, your own preferences of how you would organize it. Uh, so let's add a parameter here. The main parameters for our method, I'm just gonna get our code and docs side by side now. I've reorganized channels so things are a little cleaner. Um, that's, I need the parameters here and here. You're gonna define them in the specification as well as code and they should match and be consistent all the way throughout. So we have uh, leaders, which is a required parameter. I think most of this we're talking about combustion, right? Ice. And the query string and data type is a string. It's required. Um, how do we do an enum? just a little bit off screen. Uh, this is another open source project, Open API GUI 3. And essentially the enum values will be, this is another thing, we have to make our API consistent. I don't want to do too much parsing. Oh yeah, and uh, Dejavid, our what's your um, framework? Because that's where a framework really becomes helpful. Uh, not having to reinvent the wheel. Um, by way of example, Sales JS, uh, I think Feathers JS, um, Django, um, Meteor, and I think Laravel. They all they all provide you auth out of the box, uh, so you don't have to think about it. You just you know, oh, we need auth. Time to turn that on. Express node framework. Yeah, so then you're in the realm of having to, to make your own framework. Whoops. Ah. Blast. Yeah, no deal. Small. <laughs> Going to get called out for having these be inconsistent, but. Jay, the developer, thanks for your feedback. Password JS, I've heard of that too. 
heard good things about Passport. Yeah, and this um, yeah, middleware from Node, flexible modular. Very cool. Ooh, look at all these strategies for different authentication types. Oh yeah, nice. Yeah, I think they have one of these like this for Django as well. Django has default internal authentication, but then has um, Django package. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> I just used default Django auth too, but yeah. H how are you, um, how do you think Deja Vid uh, you might want people to auth authenticate, to authorize and authenticate? Authenticate and authorize. Uh, by the way, does um, Passport give you authorization? So you got authentication. not quite the same so you're still gonna have to bake uh, permissions into your app yeah, you typically don't and probably shouldn't implement your own auth and if the boss asks you to you might raise the issue with them that's it um, that's an incredibly complicated um, aspect of application development and typically is not done per application. Um, not only just to save time, but just to have a secure and functional um, code base. So I just don't think it's really something you should be invent reinventing. Okay, so I guess that's about all we need to implement here. It's just parameters. Oh yeah, we're using a little bit of Firebase too. Yeah, that's kind of nice. Now, that's the beauty of abstraction for sure. You just had a few lines of code. Um, you're gonna still need um, permissions though. Um, And again, that's something like Django just gives you authentication and authorization baked in. You don't have to think about it. You just you just follow um, conventions that are baked into the framework. Uh, so yeah, right, something like this. And this is where the Think it'll come up short in the JavaScript ecosystem with like mature um, solutions, but I don't know. I just don't want to be too harsh on that. The JavaScript ecosystem, sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Auth zero. All right, Jada developer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Passport JS is tested and well known. Yeah. Hey, Jada developer, Jada developer, do you know if uh, Passport has an extension for authorization? Like just doing access control? 
I don't know this off the top of my head, so I'm kind of just checking it out. It might be simple and uh, deja, but I don't know that your app might need a lot of um, access control, but you know, if you're doing e-commerce, you might have different roles of users that would, some people would be um, you know, making orders, for example, or checking the status of their order, maybe editing it, canceling it. Some people might be checking status of orders and editing it on behalf of others. Some people, you know, the, so those are just, some people like an administrator might need to see the whole system and what's going on. Um, so you typically need to do that. And I just remember in Meteor, um, the Meteor framework, so to speak, it's almost a framework. Anyway, it, it comes with uh, accounts baked in, but no role-based access control. So it left that to the um, community. So it has accounts base, that's part of the media core. And then UI elements, which is kind of cool, you get scaffolded and log in and log out buttons right off the bat. Sign in with the OAuth providers. Um, Meteor is not very REST oriented, though, just for what it's worth. In fact, there's the ecosystem kind of uh, doesn't have a good REST option at this point. But yeah, they didn't provide um, access control or authorization in the account system, so you have to use a plugin and roles and permissions. And then there's also issues that you're using Mongo, so you have to figure out what level your permissions would exist, usually per document. For example, some user would be checking their own orders only. But there is a package and a, a fairly easy API, but I don't know if this is just generic that you could use in uh, Express. It might be, though. Oh, this um, Atmosphere site's another weird thing. It's been recently updated. Meet your community packages. But it's very meteor centric, so I guess you can't use it in Express. You should be baking your own authorization RBAC. What's RBAC? Role based access control. Sorry, <laughs> I had to think about that one for a minute. All right, so you think that that's a place that people. Developers need to focus their time is access control. Ruby. So again, Ruby, you have to turn to a community plugin controller add additions. All right sense. Authors. Action based authorization using roles with pundit and device. Yeah, so it's got yeah, it's not part of Rails core. Let's just take check out Laravel. Authorization Laravel. I'm just always curious to see on what degree of maturity and um, inclusiveness the various um, project along the framework spectrum implement things. Um, Abilities, so it looks like it's got policies and abilities built in. You just read the docs, you don't have to go searching for it, you just know how to do it by reading the doc. .NET. Yeah, exactly. Authorization and access control, meaning you don't let people access parts of the site or information that um, they shouldn't be able to. Other people's orders, for example, you know, payment information. Uh, which hopefully you're not storing, but in general, like you know, invoices and things like that. Um, that's part of almost every app you, you'll build. In Meteor, we had to do, uh, we kind of implemented uh, our own role-based access control a little bit. Um, we tried using that Meteor roles for a while, um, but we were, yeah, just didn't quite fit the bill. But I think if you can get in a, a framework where it's got it baked in, you know, you'll be so much better for it. But I haven't really done a lot of Django to that extent. 
So let me just double check. We've got authorization, which is just how people log in and say, hey, this is who I am, and how they validate who they are. And then Django's got a permission system based, like you can call it permission systems as well. It's got group based access uh, permissions. So a group could be like a role, all your admin users, all of your um, customer care people, those could be roles. And Jade developer. What kind of a, are there any good Jade developer, any good frameworks for .NET or .NET is a framework and language, right? Let's see. What is .NET? It's like a language, ASP.NET, web framework for .NET. Oh, I'm thinking ASP, I guess. Jade developer, do you do ASP or just .NET? Like this is the language, right? And this is the framework. Looks pretty promising. I just haven't ever delved into this ecosystem. ASP is the framework. All right, do you use ASP.NET? Let's check out the architecture here. Language is C sharp. Okay, got it. <laughs> uh, I remember like most <laughs> close I've come to it is just knowing about Mono, the Mono project, I think, which was a requirement to, for a while before the language is open source or something. But yeah, I don't <laughs> really know much to see to say about it. All right, cool. Let me just check real quick. I think they should have some kind of access control or permissions. Oh, they even have an eShop on web sample application. Azure eBook. Blazor. Uh, I do allow links. Um, I had some problems with links before where I was using a bot and it deleted all the messages that somebody had sent. But let me just double check my stream settings. I'm just trying to kind of trying to keep spam off here, but not be like, you know, rude about it. Let's see, how do you, and I'm learning as I go. I check my channel permissions, I think. Yeah, I haven't had a big problem with spam, so it's not a big deal. I just couldn't the other day figure out how to delete a message. Somebody did come in the channel and sort of posted the same link several times. And it was almost just like they were asking a question and wanted to really provide the, the context. <laughs> but they just, it's like I already got the link tw twice. So but I couldn't figure out how to delete that. change the channel permissions. Dang it. Moderation, I think, is what I'm looking for. Block hyperlinks. Okay, it is on. Now I've disabled it. Go ahead and try posting the, the hyperlink now. Cool. Thanks for the help, Jay. I think it should be disabled now, the, the little blocker. I'll figure this all out as I go. I just am getting back on to uh, having a little chat sidebar up there and a couple of things. Minor improvements. Make it more interactive. Thanks. Thanks for the context. And by the way, how do I delete something? Not that I'm going to delete this one, but when I click on somebody's name, it, like I can't figure out how to just delete a specific message in my stream, in my channel manager. In any case. Very cool. All right, so let's go back to our API design. Yeah, so our, our um, fuel estimate CO2. Ah, uh, the moderation dashboard. 
I'm into moderation. Settings section, but not the moderation dashboard apparently. We've got stream manager, insights, community, roles manager, activity, channel points, insights, stream summary, content, collections, preferences, moderation, drops, streaming tools, extensions. Way different. Welcome to the mod view. Wow, this is actually a lot better than the um, stream manager. so I can have a queue of messages that are auto-moderated. I probably won't fuss with it too much. I'm going to be pretty laid back here. I haven't had any problems with spam. Good grief, there's a lot of <laughs> this. is walking me through everything. All right, 10 of 10. All right, good. Got it. All right, and it shows all the chats. Cool, very... Uh, excellent. Thank you very much, Jay, the developer. I appreciate the help. I've learned a lot from the Twitch community, definitely. All right, cool. All right, so in terms of uh, API design and consistency, my lingering questions are, just for what it's worth, I, original design of this it was just a, this estimate CO2 endpoint that used a... Um, Again, mode, transport mode and distance calculation. But now we're um, implementing this feature request for estimating mode um, by fuel type. So I need to figure out how to <laughs> uh, make these two more consistent. If I would prefix it with mode or suffix it with mode, and whether or not I would need to make a major version release, things like that. I gotta figure it out. I gotta figure it out. <laughs> the other thing about consistencies in these parameters when I look at transport mode and we're going to come to this in a moment it's an enum and all the allowed values are lowercase and that might have been something I did in fact when I originally implemented it uh, not thinking and so in the back end since we're mapping it to a, a Python enum that that uh, in Python constants are by convention all uppercase when we get the API request we have to actually do a quick mapping Right here to upper. It's not very verbose. It's just mm, little things like that. So, what do you think? Any suggestions on those? Should I just leave this implementation as it is? I probably will for this pull request at the very least. Um, all lowercase. Should I implement this as lowercase to be consistent with this, or just be inconsistent for the time being with the endpoint and the casing of the options? How annoying is it? if you have inconsistencies across endpoints as a developer. All right, we're gonna need one more parameter which allows people to override the uh, average CO2 per liter if they know um, based on fuel type in their market or industry um, the exact or more approximate, more precise value, I suppose, that people can just provide that as a parameter but this is optional also what do you think of uh, 
underscores versus camel case and URL design. For me, I find consistency really makes developing integration hacky. That's true. I fully agree with you. Principal to be surprised. Yeah, good point. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty, you know, I guess pretty firm pro proponent of the Zen of Python type. A lot of things it describes. And I think it just says basically consistency. It's important. Right? Does it say anything about consistency? Hmm. Those cases aren't special to break the rules. One preferably, only one obvious way to do it. So that's kind of a um, principle we surprise. All right. If it's version, you don't care. Yeah, that's what I think we're going to be approaching here. Is we're going to have another release. Uh, uh, major version release to indicate breaking changes were all uh, essentially uh, probably prefix this with the uh, essentially the aspect by which we're estimating CO2 so in that case it's mode transport mode Okay, yeah, and yeah, this is very minimally documented as well. This is all work in progress, so just trying to kind of not be too sloppy, but also allow myself to just progress forward. So we got leaders, all lower, allowed values here. And an average CO2 per liter. Uh, should we, we can, uh, Keeping a unit in there, I think. Probably across this whole thing, to be honest. Not being explicit about units has caused a lot of problems, um, big and small. <laughs> what was the most recent thing we were recently get, grappling with? Um, implicit units. Well, even just this library has been pretty confusing. Uh, oh, whether it's tons or kilograms or grams and stuff, it's just, yeah. <laughs>
pull request is still a draft. I need to just one second. request over here and say whoops we're in draft sorry about that oh how do you put um, pull request back in draft mode It's live in the sense we're using it for internal purposes. So we're eating our own tofu uh, and that we're getting feedback from industry stakeholders, but I don't think it's widely deployed. Um, but it's hard to tell, you know, when you're, you have an open source library. Uh, I think you can get some statistics about if the, for example, Python library has been used in many projects, uh, what are we called? Or it's just transports here too. But I don't even know where to get those. We've It's got GitHub statistics. Yeah, anyway, if you wanted to dig more into it, uh, hey, what's up? Bastel bro, Basti bro, welcome to the chat. If you're wanting to get involved with these types of projects, we welcome any co uh, contributions or ideas. If you're interested in uh, sustainability or mobility. Hmm. Yeah, we're not really going for popularity metrics right now. We're just trying to get a, a useful library together and I mentioned we are using it internally uh, and it's going under some internal peer review right now uh, with pretty good results and I can't say much more about it but I think we'll have a kind of a big announcement uh, a little bit later. I think the people um, who've shown the most interest from other companies have been I'm not sure exactly if Eric M1995, who opened the issue I'm currently working on, or at CNMIT J, uh, they, they might be at this turn organization, T-U-R-N-N, but I'm not sure. Uh, you know, it's kind of mobility geeks and companies uh, in the mobility industry who are m the main stakeholders here. All right, so we've got average liter per gram CO2. And let me just double check if I refactored, if I changed the method name, then I need to update the API specification here. Actually, but first I need to check the yeah, estimate CO2 grams. So we're going to be get fuel. Um, I made it with my colleague Marcus Shepard or Shepke, and he's an excellent Python developer. So, I, in honesty, uh, need to give him a lot of credit uh, for the architecture we're following. And um, I mainly focused on the HTTP API aspect of it and a fledgling um, estimator function and kind of research. And Marcus is the uh, He's really carried it forward, though. He's a maven, an excellent coder, uh, and is in the process of, again, using this internally in some sort of uh, data analytical and data science-y, uh, um, like this project we've been working on for a couple of months. So it's <laughs> pretty cool. We're collaborating on that using Jupyter Notebooks and stuff. But that is not open source. I wish I could show more about that. Uh, it's pretty fun and interesting stuff. I will mention that <laughs> just we're using Jupyter Lab. 
if you're just interested in kind of, you know, what are interesting tools and fun and useful things. Um, Mass Global is a mobility as a service offering, M-A-A-S, which is not to be confused with metal as a service <laughs> or heavy metal as a service, but um, mobility as a service essentially takes the idea of transportation and adds um, a creamy frosting of usability on top. I think when we talk about transport planning or, um, what do they call it, what do they call it? In any case, um, a lot of times the emphasis is on the modes of transport and the fleet or the geography or topography of um, bureau bureaucratic considerations like this is zone A, zone B, zone C. Um, you know, so their transport operators looking through the lens of their internal bureaucratic structures and um, constraints of the modalities and stuff. Um, and mobility operators actually just start from people's needs and try to keep the focus there. Like, essentially, we just need to go from point A to point B. We don't usually care about the mode too much or whether I'm going, if point A is in zone C and point B is in zone Q. It doesn't really matter, especially when we're traveling. It's confusing. So there's a lot of inconsistency, and what mo Mobility as a Service promises to do is just hopefully simplify it, give you choices in a single app, uh, and get you where you need to go in a way that's convenient and enjoyable that you prefer. So, And some people are increasingly aware of the carbon costs of their personal mobility choices, so we're just trying to raise that up to the surface um, by making this app, uh, this uh, library, and hopefully incorporating a uh, design process around it. Uh, so that's what we're doing, Jade Developer. Our app is called WIM. I don't want to be too, I'm not trying to be spammy here, but uh, just so you can uh, see the field. And we also got some feedback uh, on this sustainable mobility uh, API from a company called Turn in the Netherlands. They're another mobility operator. Mobility as a service is actually becoming a kind of a big thing, to be honest. Uh, it's not just our company. If you look at the, hmm, well, a lot, of, a lot of companies are wanting to get in, in involved in different ways. Um, I guess I could just say Mobi Mass Alliance is one uh, really cool initiative. And what we're basically trying to do is, yeah, we exist in a market capitalistic framework of competition and scarcity, um, but we're dealing with um, societal goals and, you know, things like sustainability and health and uh, we need to keep those up there and promote some sort of harmony in in this sector so I don't know how successful we'll be but the alliance mass alliance is formed to kind of promote some sort of harmony so for what it's worth there's a lot of companies who are active here you know Google uber there's my colleague Krista Pia, she's from Finland originally. Erwin, a lot of, I work with a few of these people on online conferences. And there's just a lot of companies, uh, both governmental, commercial, there's transport operators, mobility operators, there's service providers like Siemens who are wanting to do technology, infrastructure, and API standardization. There's a lot of interesting stuff. There's bike share providers, car share. Um, PTB Group, for example, are doing a lot with transport modeling and artificial intelligence. There's, it's crazy. Um, so I'm just, look, I see Uber's here as part of this mass alliance. Um, I'm just working on a little facet, a little small pick piece of the picture uh, for the sustainability part. But hopefully by working openly and publishing this, uh, it'll kind of have a positive um, effect, maybe a positive peer pressure, not only on other mobility operators, but maybe our partners and stuff. And certainly our company. We're taking it seriously. Again, we're doing an internal thing, but I think in a couple of months, if you check out the WIMAP um, blog, you might see an announcement relating to um, specifically carbon, <laughs> as much as, as specific as I can get, to be honest. Oh, location as a service. Hey, welcome back, Dr. Underfade. Good seeing you. Location as a service, what does that uh, entail? Jay, I've never heard of that. 
Let me just adjust a little bit real quick. How goes it, Dr. Underfree? What have you been up to lately? Get a little bit more tea. Actually, now that I hear the sound of the tea, I just need to take a brief break. I'll be right back. All right, thanks for bearing with me there. And uh, just another quick mention, uh, so on our internal eating our own tofu, using this um, little library, we have used Jupyter Lab and this cool um, time series modeling library from Facebook called Profit. So if you're interested in machine learning, in particularly machine learning with time series data in either R or Python, check this out. It's very neat. And I guess it's fair since we're a developer oriented uh, uh, stream. If there's anybody who's interested in working in the mobility as a service sector, we do have a few positions here. So that's all. I'm not trying to get any uh, personal benefit or again, not trying to be too spammy. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, it's there's a lot of cool stuff. Very interesting. Uh, line of work and um, it needs people of all different skills and backgrounds to make it happen cool luckily I've come from a little bit of a sustainability and a geographic uh, background so this is this project has been a really good fit for, for what I've been doing locations as a service That's a pretty cool idea. I like it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's actually really important. And that idea of location and place, you can unpack that. You can write a <laughs> probably a master's thesis on that. And I took a, just a course in uh, at Evergreen State College uh, on basically we explored this concept of having a sense of place and what all that entails. It's um, pretty interesting. It's not just about geography and, you know, geographic coordinates and uh, it's about culture and relationships and memory and, you know, history. Uh, and it's always changing and movement. Hmm. Eco ecology, you know, it's actually kind of one of the things that pivoted me towards sustainability. And just in the mobility as a service, we're dealing with a lot of location information. Um, you know, obviously people want to start somewhere and they need to get somewhere. So that's one thing. And they might not know exactly where they want to get. It could be a category of location, like a grocery store nearby, right? Um, but we're also dealing with a lot of location data that pertains to transport networks. So bus stops, floating fleet, um, docking locations well floating fleet's not quite the same as a docked fleet it sort of is or just vehicle locations in a floating fleet yeah and, th and those le those are tr locations that change all the time so you have to have real-time location data in that case jay have you looked at any of these standards for um for example there's the bike i can't remember this name but there's so many acronyms 
let me just tomp. This is one working group I've been work, uh, involved with loosely. I haven't been, they, they've been making great strides. They're defining these transport operator mobility provider APIs. So it's a lot of words. Transport operators manage fleet usually. They have like the scooters, the bikes, the buses, taxis, mobility, mobility for <laughs> Mobility providers do the user experience layer on top of that. And there's a lot of companies working in there. But this um, project was, was uh, inspired by hmm, was a bike sharing specification. <laughs> Geofencing, yeah, that's it. Like, for example, you get a scooter, but you can only park it in certain areas of the city if it's a floating fleet. OMP, GBFS, General Bike Feed Specification, Bike Share Feed Specification. Yeah, this is like a format uh, we're kind of dealing with um, on bike sharing networks. And then there's several other standards. I don't want to get too far afield here. Um, and plus, my memory is not fresh on these. But we're, we're trying to deal with location data in various standardized forms. Google GTFS is a really common one. And um, some of it is static data, but they're so general transit feed specification. Uh, but increasingly, there's there's non-static location data, right? These vehicles that move around, so it's a big challenge, and there's a, a lot of interesting work going on in that area. I'm not directly involved with much of it. Yeah, but there, there's some open source projects anyway. I'm gonna see if I can get a little bit more progress on this. API, get my pull request ready, uh, and try to cut the um, maybe the live code session down about, about two and a half hours. Right now we're at two hours. After like two hours, I start to just go downhill in my, um, and I just can't think clearly. So it's it's good to have these non sequitur discussions. Get fuel CO two estimate. So. This we're calling inside of our, our API.py. Let's double check. Get fuel CO2 estimates implemented. It's going to pass in two parameters. It's going to pass in liters and average CO2 per liter, which both can be initialized as none. You going going to work from home, Doctor Armprint? Is that WFH work from home? I'm doing pretty good. Enjoying enjoying the day. Enjoying some live streaming. Just hanging out. Ah, uh, also. Have you heard of isochrones, uh, Jay the developer? I'm just remembering when you're mentioning how far how far you can travel from a given point. This is going to bring project, um, an open source project. There's a few of these, but you might be you might have already encountered this. But for what it's worth, if you're in a given place, what are the places, the locations you can access within a certain amount of time traveled um, by either incorporating different transit modes or other things. Um, I think there's this, uh, it'll come to me in a minute. Open street. Map can apparently calculate those. Are you working much with open street map data for your location data? And there's this really cool open source tool, Graph Hopper. I was actually looking at this earlier in Valhalla. Yeah, if you check out some of the resources on this, um, Open Trip Planner is now getting support for um, multimodal journeys. I know that much. They're in the process of developing that. And they're supporting a lot of these. Um... Okay, great. Hey, Dr. Unafraid, I also adjusted the stream um, quality. I lowered it so it wouldn't take up so much bandwidth. So hopefully the audio is clear. 
and the text on the screen is legible. If, if not, if you can't read the text, for example, in the code editor, I'll just bump up the quality a little bit. But I, I kind of put it down to about half of what it was by default. Um, what is it? Uh, OP, OBS has this little wizard that checks your bandwidth and sets your stream quality. It was like 6,000 or something like that. I don't remember. <laughs> I just halved it. All right, so J developers only storing data, haven't done enrichment. Okay, cool, yeah. You might even just check out some of these existing storage layers. The, the open source uh, projects could be useful, and you could focus on the, the fun stuff. All right, so once we get this in our, in our function body, we'll have two parameters. What we're going to do is going to get a CO2 estimate. At this point, I can just kind of return. And again, I think a lot of this is not really required. Uh, connection should handle some of the validation. I'm not sure why we wrote so much. the most important argument, the fuel type. Oh, wait a minute. No, I didn't. Whoa. Yeah, I did. Fuel type would be required. Average CO2 per liter is optional. All right. I'm not paying attention. Got ADD. I just <laughs> easily confused myself here. human and we all make simple mistakes. We're looking good though. Well, that's cool. Jay, are you thinking about making a business out of it? Uh, you mentioned the location as a service, so it seems like you would be hosting this, and other um, companies could integrate with it. And actually, you know, to be honest, um, 
mobility as a service providers, there's value here. I see we not only want to help people get around, but maybe find places to get to that meet their needs, right? So an API like this location as a service could be really integrated very easily um, into these mobility offerings. In fact, we've done a um, sort of a, wasn't a prototype, it was actually production, but uh, what was it? Helsinki Art Festival or something like that. There's this week-long festival in Helsinki where all these galleries have events around town and we partnered with them and displayed on the on a, the map in our app all the locations around town you could go to at any given time that had an active exhibit or an event like a you know a cocktail party or whatever going on like that. Uh, so that I think Jay, your location as a service could really tie in to these kind of companies in the mobility uh, as a service sphere because we're really much we're very much focused on user needs and where they want to go and help help them find places that they want to get to and get them there. So essentially, we're just going to grab a few. Um, yeah, developing an API for estimating the carbon impact of mobility. It's um, a little Python library with an HTTP wrapper around it, so people, so companies can deploy it despite their infrastructure if they're not using Python, for example. And we just want to grab that fuel type. I think it's going to happen here. These are named, but I don't know if it's the order matters on this. Probably not. I just want to change the order of these parameters. So that way, can't move it up or down. It. So it's okay. Yeah, that's right. You know, our work is important in. Oftentimes it helps us grow, but I've also seen a lot of opportunity here with, um, you know, these distancing measures, the social distancing and whatnot to like kind of reflect and uh, center down and kind of find, you know, touch base back with ourselves and, and see what's really what we're passionate about and where we're going and how much our day, daily work is enriching that or how, you know, how much we're serving those, those greater missions um, that we've discovered in life. All right, so we've got a fuel type. And. I don't want to do too much in one line, but essentially there's a couple optional arguments. Sure, if this will work, but if I pass in these none, if, if it comes back none or empty string from the API, I'll have to test it, of course. But let's go ahead and try this. System across there, so I got a typo already. <laughs> Didn't change it in all the places.
really I can just return this response though. can do is actually run this locally and see if it works. So let me refresh my memory on how we did that. So we go to the API directory and we will I think as soon as I can just invoke this handler, that, well, wait a minute, api.py, all right, so we need an environment, we're using pip environment for this project, make sure all our dependencies are installed. Python. This is what we've got in our API Pi. We just have a server method here that runs our Flask app. I don't know why we. Anyway, <laughs> some, of the, some of these conventions are questionable, Marcus. All right, what do we got? Importer, can I import name fuel from transport CO2? Ah. That's a problem. So basically, <laughs> our Python library and our API coexist in the same kind of GitHub repository. But our um, API project and Essentially, our um, Python environment is going to be importing transport CO2 from Python packaging index. So it expects a published version. So I'm kind of going carriage before horse here. Okay, Jay, the developer. Jay, thanks for stopping by, actually. Oh, what time zone are you in, by the way? It's pretty late there. Yeah, I hope to see you on the stream more, and we'll... Definitely chat more about mobility, and I'll be looking forward to learning about your location as a service idea, and maybe we can make some kind of a connection between uh, your idea as it becomes more of a reality and um, one of these mobility apps. So yeah, I don't know how to resolve this. I think I just need to have two separate pull requests, one for uh, these fuel efficient factors and the other for publishing the API. So at this point, the fuel efficient factors, this is looking good. Fuel emission factors. And I'll basically fork my branch or something <laughs> and uh, copy and paste these API changes over there. Both for the specification, which I've changed here, and the API.py.
how to go about this. Essentially, I've got a commit here. What is this commit? If I push that commit, hmm. how do you pick it the last commit and get it? Okay, so I can push this and then call that good. Don't commit the changes to the specification of the API. Open another branch. All right, good. Ah, oh, I caught that early. That means we can proceed with this review. Refresh. Then only the estimator and the model have changed. Mark this is ready to go. Next step, new branch. Copy everything from our API. So we don't lose it, I'll revert it. specification from online as JSON copy that paste it format it I'm just going to change the order of these. I don't know if it matters, but since it's optional. It to <laughs> grams, but we, it's a misnomer. It's grams, so I need to fix that. Let me just double check that our our estimator is uh, using grams here. I think I'm double and triple check that, but I'm going to quadruple it. Yes.
Oh, gotta be consistent. Don't want to be too far off the mark. All right, I think basically we got our branch created. should use consistent name for things everywhere. Uh, I was just reading in the specification our return value CO2 estimate G and in the API I mean it might not seem like it matters but it just gets confusing we're returning CO2 estimate. So just keep things explicit and keep that unit around avoid ambiguity and we'll push this change up and we're right at two and a half hours I think my teacup has been filled and emptied several times my <laughs> teacup up here is overflowing as is usual after a couple hours of coding and I've had some great discussions uh, with Jay and Dr. Underfraid it's nice to meet new people and see familiar Names around the chat. Let's see who else. Deja Vid came back and said hello. Uh, looks like I pushed the changes up there. So what we're going to do is open another pull request. This is 43, and the other one will be pending 43 or blocked by 43. I must not have pushed the changes up. So we've got a notice. Maybe, maybe Marcus finally reviewed our other pull request. Nope. Start everything together. Cool, we'll wait for the pull request review. Could take a day or, or two, you never know. Depends on how many uh, changes are suggested or how far afield the, um, the implementation is from the, the idea or the need it's trying to meet. We're kind of keeping things small. We don't want to get too complicated. And get, so we can just, you know, in a lean or agile fashion, Make something tangible, get some feedback on it, and improve it a little bit at a time. So yes, this has been another CodeBuddies.org live coding hangout. Appreciate everybody who joined us on the Twitch chat. It's always great to have company while we're doing these projects, particularly in these times of social distancing. If you want to check out this project, the GitHub link is right over th there, sorry, <laughs> uh, github.com slash mass global slash sustainable mobility API. Also stop by the codebuddies.org community. There's a lot of different hangouts and groups who are interested in exploring various topics and technologies. The codebuddies.org platform is also open source and is currently being redeveloped or the next 
generation is being developed from the ground up using the Django web framework on the back end and React on the front end. So if you're interested in participating in an open source project, regardless of your experience, we have uh, tasks uh, that are suitable for newcomers and experienced coders alike. And we have a friendly atmosphere, we'll mentor you and learn from you. Everyone here is a mentor and a teacher at the same time. Thanks again for stopping by the Hangout. Kaiser 6, Jay the developer. Kaiser 6, thanks for the raid, bringing by all your friends, I appreciate that. Deja vu, it was good to see you again. Dr. Unafraid, good to see you again. Hope to see you around the Code Buddies community. Stay safe and well out there.